Right, well, welcome to this uh, Midfix podcast. This session is on BS8539 2012 and how it affects M&E in general, building services. And to discuss the subject today, we've got Pete Gordon from Rollplug. Welcome, welcome, Pete. Uh, Pete, just a little bit of an introduction to yourself. Um, quite a while in the industry. Yes, uh, longer than I'd like to admit to, really, but I've been in the industry maybe 32, 33 years. Oh, that's a uh, good time. Starting at distributor level, but the last sort of 15 to 18 years of my career, it's been mainly for manufacturers and working maybe nine, ten of those purely in technical sales and okay. covering aspects of site testing, uh, specification support. Uh, a big part of the role nowadays is training. Yeah, uh, both to distributors and contractors, and uh, promoting best practice. And that's all range of fixings. That's not just M and E, isn't it? You're looking at civil. No, no, that, you're that's, looking that's, at that's facade. That's everyth everything. Yeah. You know, we, we train everything from. Um, uh, we have twenty two thousand uh, articles in the portfolio, split into ten yeah. subsections. So it's everything from you know lightweight fixings, bonded anchors, mechanical fixings, all the way through to gas. Uh, power actuated tools as well and you're a true manufacturer yeah that's yeah yeah, that's yeah. One of the key we're, areas. We're, we're now the third largest manufacturer of fixings in europe right good yeah so that's your that's your background thank you yeah. for that pete uh, i didn't want to mention the 35 years experience yeah, but yeah. you know somebody's oh. somebody's got to at some point yeah, yeah. so today we're going to be discussing bs8539 and yeah. how it affects contractors suppliers manufacturers could you just give us a rough overview of what it is and, and what more importantly why it came into practice back in 2012 yeah, BS8539 was a, an adaption of um, an Irish standard that was brought out um, after a, a major fatality on site. Right. And it was adapted and driven through the CFA, which is Construction Fixings Association, yeah. uh, as a code of practice. And uh, it's it's to really to promote the best practice from installation, uh, fixing selection of anchors, um, installation is key, yeah. but also the testing um, pre and post testing of anchors as well okay. and although it's not a legally binding uh, document as such it can be referred to um, in a court of law uh, so you know we encourage people to utilize use and adapt their working practices to try and uh, engage with all the good uh, best practice options that BS8539 promotes. Okay so if basically if we or a contractor follows BS8539 and the guidance therein we will end up with a compliant installation then, yeah? Yeah, I think that the problem is that, you know, over time in this <coughs> industry, um, people have changed specifications for either practical or commercial reasons. But yeah. there's been no set uh, course of uh, process right. um, to ensure that, you know, on a specification it will say equal or greater than in, in uh, if you're gonna change the fixing. Yeah. But, you know, where is the competence in, in from a contractor's point of view, right. to say that's the correct fixing. So it's who's done that due diligence yeah, and, and, yeah, and made sure, yeah. But there's a, a set process now which involves, uh, and it involves all the stakeholders from designers, um, manufacturers, right. distributors, uh, main contractors, all the way to the installer. So there's a set process and every stakeholder has got a part to play um, in, in the process of BSA 539. So it okay. just gives you some traceability and, and the set responsibilities within the, the, the yeah. structure, which means you know, the end game is to have a safe installation and use the correct anchor as designed and installed to the manufacturer's guidelines. Yeah, and I suppose one of the key elements is you must be able to prove that you've actually followed the steps. Y yeah, yeah. Th there's there's documentation within the the, the toolkit yeah. for BSA five three nine where you know there's recording of the, the correct anchor. You've got to refer to the, to the actual design drawing itself, um, even to the point of where you have to order the correct part code. Yeah. The part code itself should be stipulated in the design. Right. So th there's traceability, really. So, you know, if anything does go wrong, you can trace back where and how that fixing specification was uh, initially brought about okay. or changed. And I know you mentioned, just touching on it now, but I know you mentioned the CFA earlier, the Construction Fixing Association, yeah. that they do some excellent uh, online checklists that you can uh, yeah, if complete if once if you've done an you install. Yeah, if you go onto their website, there's, there's, there's loads of tools, there's a uh, BS8539 toolkit, tool kit. Yep. and you can download all sorts of documentation, guidance notes, and it, I'd recommend people do that. 
Okay, thank you for that. So, BS8539, we, we, you're going to take us through the, the correct selection process, mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. uh, the supply of that product to the site. So once yeah. it's been selected, how do we ensure it reaches site? Yeah. The installation of that product, which yeah. is probably the biggest variable, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and testing. Yeah. So if I can start with the selection process then, Pete, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, a key thing that's mentioned in BS8539 is an ETA anchor. Could you t describe what that is, please, and explain it? Yeah. E ETA is a European Technical Assessment uh, document, and <coughs> the ETA is everybody's um, guarantee of safety, really, because in years gone by, you could generate um, your own data as a manufacturer, right? Um, just by doing in-house testing, and you could do ten tests, and you could say, "Oh, that the data sheet is for this anchor, an average load of ten kilonewtons," yeah. and. and there's no independent verification of that. The, the idea of the, U, U, the ETA is that you submit your product to an independent testing house. Right. Uh, it, it goes through a set regime, uh, quite a stringent regime. And for instance, during the process, they will uh, over install the anchor, over torque it, they'll use worn new drill bits, they'll right. um, over torque it, they'll fix it closer than it should be to an edge. And it's the mean, mean value of all these results that give you your ETA loading. So something, say, that has a 10 kilonewton load in um, in a laboratory might only assess down to an 8.5 after an ETA approval. Okay. That approval costs anywhere between 100 and 150,000 euros per fixing. All right, so it's not- Five sizes. It's know. not It's not something we can replicate on site then? No, no, no. but, but, but it, it's, it protects the manufacturer from the point of view that if you've t put your fixing through this rigorous testing, and your results are independent. Yeah, you can support that with documentation. Um, there's ETA documents you can download, or the manufacturer could supply you, yeah. proving the loads uh, uh, as stated. Yeah. And that's our main uh, contribution as a manufacturer: that the data we give out is independently verified. And then when they design the fixing, that's the load values they use. When they test on site, that's the load values that are used. So you know, it's not some spurious laboratory-driven uh, no. load that somebody's, you know, done in the back of the garage. It's, it's, so it's, it's a harmonised set of standards yeah, there. Yeah, and, and, it, and, it, and it's, and it's uh, you know, whether you're a designer, whether you're installer, you can utilise the, 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 um, the data yeah. that's been uh, made by the ETA testing. So if the ETA says the safe working load <coughs> is 2 kilonewtons, 200 kilos, that's what the fixing right. will be approved to do. So then that means that we as a supplier and a contractor yeah. knows how that anchor's going to perform then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's independently verified. It's not yeah. the raw plug telling you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or it's not the distributor telling you as a contractor. You've got uh, data you can refer to, and you can confidently, uh, if, if the installation conditions are as per the ETA, yeah. you know, the concrete strength, etc., you know that that uh, fixing will achieve that load value okay. in the right criteria. And I suppose the cost of the ETA <coughs> is one of the reasons why not all anchors have ETAs, then. Is that right? Yes, uh, cost is a big element, but also as well, uh, if you're looking at safety critical applications, mm. it's much more important to have an ETA approved product than okay. it would be for say, a lightweight domestic okay. application. As I say, it, it's everybody's uh, guarantee of safety really, throughout right. the process. Which is why then, BS8539 tells us where possible use an anchor with an ETA. Well, BS8539 does state that where there is an option yep. for an anchor with an ETA, it should be uh, designed from it stage one. So it should be used. Yeah, right. and then obviously that ETA then supports the quality of that fixing all the way through to the installation. Okay, so that's one point then. Mm. When you're selecting the anchor, make sure it's got an ETA. What are the other key areas we need to look at when selecting an, an anchor for an application? Obviously there's, there's six criteria you should look at when, you, uh, when you're uh, putting forward an anchor yeah. uh, for selection. Uh, first and foremost is substrate. Right. That's that's the main one because obviously, if you're using uh, concrete with a compressive strength, you can do all your fixing uh, specification by design. Mm -hmm. It's when you get involved in sort of block work, voiding materials, terracotta pots, yeah. things like that. The that, unknowns. That's, that's when, you know, y you really need to be very very careful what you select, and that's where you need some advice really from a, man a manufacturer. Yeah. I would suggest. Yeah. Um, but then also as well, you need to look at the um, load. Mm -hmm. that fixing is taking uh, you know can the fixing perform to the load requirement 
Mm -hmm. You've got the type of installation that it is. So is it going to be uh, an expansion anchor, bonded anchor? Yeah. You've got um, how the fixing is, is um, applied. Is it going to be um, a through fix or a flush? Or fix? a flush fix? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then also you've got uh, another major factor in there is approvals. Mm -hmm. Um, approvals, especially with such critical anchors, is key, and this is where the ETA documentation supports it. Okay. And yeah. then finally, you've got environment. You know, do you need to, as a fix, you've got to have a corrosion protection. So those six criteria should always be uh, applied to every fixing that you install, okay. basically. But then also there's things like you know uh, installation equipment that you need, additional accessories. Um, as well and the correct drill bit and things like that so there's quite a few things you need to take consideration but again all this information is yeah. available uh, on, on data sheets and also you know from manufacturers also you know distributors who've got good product knowledge can give the contractor all this information well yeah i think you've touched on something there because <coughs> within bs 8539 as far as a supplier is concerned that bit you just mentioned there about setting tools and torque wrenches mm -hmm. for through bolts for instance uh, it's down to us as a distributor to ensure that the um, the customer is aware that with a through bolt, for instance, you do need a torque wrench because it is physically impossible to set a through bolt without a torque wrench, and we have to explain why that's required. So that's how deep BS eight five three nine goes into it. it. It maps out every stakeholder's responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. a mechanical anchor, you've got mainly three types. You know, you've got um, torque controlled anchors, which mm -hmm. majority of them are, mm -hmm. and it does what it says on the can. Yeah. In the, in, and <coughs> torque is is the measure of how the fixing is going to perform. If you over torque it, you can stress the anchor. Yep. If you under torque it, you're not going to reach the uh, the manufacturer's ETA approved loads. Yeah. Then you've got deformation controlled anchors, which is like your dropping anchors. Most yeah, common which one. which in which our we'll, industry we'll, we'll is we'll cover yeah. a bit later on. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got undercut anchors, things like where you, you, you you're changing the geometry mm -hmm. of the drill hole either by drilling a conical hole or in the case of a screw bolt you're cutting a thread yeah. and you just fill the void that, that you, your action's made so all these things there's a lot more to selecting the fixing than you think and that's why you know your design is quite key uh, that the designers understand all the criteria required and as a distributor the distributor needs to also understand all these, these criteria but at the end of the day as an installer I think it's down to you to understand exactly what you're putting into for an application into what substrate and why. Oh, that, that I fully agree. It is very important <coughs> for the installer, but I also think, or we also think, that it's it's not right that the installer has the responsibility of the specification of that anchor because they're not they won't have access to all the information that they require. Well, this is why training is quite key. Yeah, you know, training is very e education and training. Just enough knowledge to know that what you're doing is correct, or to even for you to ask a question. Ask questions. Yeah, yeah. If you don't. But, you know, know. It, 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 it's quite important that you know you, you understand uh, the risks involved and you understand what's required yeah. when you're installing the fixing because you know the bi the biggest problem we have is, is traditional methods of fixing um, and with new building materials there's a lot more lightweight products now mm. there's a lot more voided products because of the uh, insulation values that you get with them and, and, the, and the light to handle but you know 90% of the old expansion fixes won't work yeah. In, in, the, in these areas so you do yeah. need to have a quite a major understanding of, of, of how the fixing works and as I say training's key I think it, it's a yeah, really it is, big yeah. part of it in every aspect isn't it yeah so we've gone through those six points yeah. of due diligence we've yeah. selected the right anchor yeah. we then need to make sure that that reaches the site don't we yeah, yeah. because there's there's issues with supply chain as well isn't there yeah. and BS8539 again helps us out with that it does because Within the, um, the sort of process from fixing selection, which is one of the key things that, yeah. that BS8539 promotes, correct in, uh, selection is the key thing. Yeah. Because, you know, wh whatever the process are after that, if it's not the right fix in the first place, it's a bit immaterial. Yeah. yeah. So once you've got that on the drawing, it should actually put the code number or the code part or the, or the description, the manufacturer description should be on the drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the distributor then has to order that part. Also checking that the dimensions are right from the point of view of diameter and length. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it gets to site, the contractor or the installer should check on the box that the fix that is applied is as of the design. And that's where BS 8539 uh, is good because you've got those sort of chain of command almost uh, responsibilities all the way down. 
So, so, so it's not good enough then for us to change that to an alternative anchor that is a similar size, no, a no, similar description. No, this is this is where the ETA documentation really comes into force because if you've got the approval on your anchor, first and foremost, um, if we just quickly go over approvals, the main one we're in interested in is the ETA documentation, mm -hmm. and anchors fall into two sections. You've got uh, cracked and non-cracked concrete. Right. Now, in cracked concrete, the anchor will achieve a number between uh, one and seven, mm -hmm. so it's one to six. Um, the lower the number is in that scale, the more rigorous the fixing has been tested. And yep. then for standard concrete, it's seven to 12. So most European manufacturers will have an option one in cracked concrete and an option seven in non-cracked concrete. So if you're changing the fixing over, first and foremost, you've got to make sure your fixing is going to adhere to that yep. uh, standard. But more importantly, we would always advise to get the fixing redesigned because just because you've got two anchors that look similar, the same size and the same dimensions yeah. um, and the same type, even if they uh, comply with the same ETA number, you've still got to look at how that fixing will perform in situ in design because some manufactured anchors have got better loadings at shorter edges, some are less affected by axial spacings and just because the fixing says on a data sheet it'll do 10 kilonewton, once you start implementing edges and, and, yeah, and, and yeah. other fixings, that can drop by 60%. So we okay. would always advise the manufacturer is throw that emphasis back to us. We can re redesign the fixing for you. Yeah. And to ensure that if you do change specification, that responsibility is with us as a manufacturer. Yeah. And then you can say, well, this fixing, this wall plug fixing, um, is equal to or outperforms the specified fixing in that design. Yeah. Is date sheets aren't enough. That's the safest way, isn't it? Then yeah. you ensure that people don't replace cracked approved with non cracked for instance, which yes. which can be really yeah. easily done. Yeah, easily yeah. done. And again, you know, if you've got a, an anchor that's got an ETA for ten kilonewtons mm -hmm. and somebody's got an anchor that's gone through a, a an in in internal um, laboratory process, ten kilonewtons, you'll probably find that that one through an ETA would drop down to maybe eight or 7.5. Mm -hmm. So you've got to really go for like for like in every aspect possible. Okay. And 8539 does really try to cement that into place where before that was the main issue of, of where a lot of the failures were happening. Okay then. So we've looked at <coughs> selecting it correctly in the first place. Yeah. We've looked at ensuring it reaches site. Now comes the biggest variable, in my mind anyway, it's how it's installed. Yes. You know, 10 installers, 10 anchors all the same we could have 10 different results at the end of the day how do we tackle the installation then first and foremost training i know we've mentioned training earlier but this is yeah. where and when we say training we just opened a, a training academy where we do installer training um on a monthly basis we do bespoke training for uh, contractors as well but the main point of training would be the, the toolbox talk mm -hmm. uh, you know we we always try to uh, encourage contractors installers to, to use the manufacturer or a lot of distributors do toolbox talks as well but toolbox talks are key yeah because you're just reinforcing <coughs> uh, the correct method of installation but if you look at failures on fixings uh, you could safely say 95 96 percent of them are due to installer error yeah there's three main areas where fixings can fail uh, the main one is incorrect installation yeah the other ones incorrect um, uh, well it would be if it's the wrong selection in the first place looking at those six criteria we mentioned earlier so it was never given the yeah. opportunity to perform or, or, then, the yeah. sub, or the substrate wasn't what was um, yeah. we was told at the time yeah. that's a, that's the key one so yeah. for instance you'll have like an expansion anchor for concrete and then when you get to site it's hollow beam right and the expansion anchor won't work so that's yeah. the other one and then the third one really would be uh, faulty manufacture of the, of the anchor now in my 33, 35 years, I've come across that twice. Yeah. And I'm on site three days a week. Yeah. So fixing is a very, very simple um, piece of equipment. The the the, uh, the amount of safety that's built into design is normally like four to one. So really, if it's a correct anchor in the correct um, substrate and it's been installed correctly, yeah. it should never, ever fail. Okay. So normally, um, and the biggest culprits are resin systems and that's usually because people haven't cleaned them out properly mm -hmm. 
Uh, so that's an installation issue and a train issue. Uh, but the biggest culprits, unfortunately, is in the M&E industry, is the, uh, the drop-in anchor. The famous drop-in anchor. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, there is a, a statistic out there, I think, that, that does the rounds that says 80% of drop-ins are installed incorrectly. Personally, I think that's wrong. I think it's more like 90, 95% <laughs> are installed incorrectly. I, I, I think yeah. that for, for us as a manufacturer, it's a very, very simple uh, benchmark, is if you compare the amount of drop-in anchors yourself compared to the amount of set of tools, yeah. It must mean that every installer is probably installing ten thousand fixings on their own. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with one setting tool. So, yeah. uh, and that's a deformation controlled anchor, which is key that it's set correctly yeah. for it to work. Uh, well, either either um, a situation a few years ago on a site where all the services had collapsed, and um, when we went to inspect it, uh, not only had not been set correctly, it hadn't been set at all. They literally knocked the anchor in, just put a bolt through, thinking that was enough to. Okay. Now, yeah. you'd, you'd love to think people are, uh, have installed these enough times to know that's not correct. But then you get new people on jobs, you get new crews coming in, but you get people who are doing this installation for the first time. So we, you really need to push the training elements of it. Well, there's not only that. If you've been shown wrong in the first place, you're just going to repeat that yeah. every time. And, yeah, and it, yeah. it's they are a critical anchor because look where most of them are used, overhead. Well, we've took the stance of the manufacturer not to supply any non-approved dropping anchors because, mm -hmm. for me, Overhead is critical application. It is, yeah. yeah. You can technically argue whether it is or isn't and the weights, but if anything light falls on your head to me, it's quite nice. Yeah, of course it is, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's this sort of concertina effect with mechanical services as well, because once you fail on the first two fixings, that load gets transferred to the next ones and so on and so forth. Yeah, well so the, mul the multiple use. Yeah, the uh, multiple use of it, aspect yeah. of it. So it, 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 is the, it is the one that causes us the most problems. And I've been out doing pull-out tests on behalf of clients and I've actually seen people set them in front of me yeah. with bits of rod or a nail or something. Yeah. And it, it, it and it is uh, a big concern. Or even yeah. down to the hammer, they don't use a hammer with sufficient weight because they do take some setting. They're very, very difficult to, in to, yeah. to install properly, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, the, the setting tools have shoulders on them. A lot of the ones now from the European uh, manufacturers will have indentation marks, like sacrificial well, witness, marks. Yeah, so witness mark, yeah. when you install it and you've, you've hit the shank all the way home it'll imprint maybe four dots on the anchor yeah. and then us as, as, as technical um, testers we can go undo the, the rod or undo the bolt and we can see now if the um, the fix has been installed properly so again right. if you use a manufacturer who's got a, a witness mark on their on, on, on their pr on their uh, installation tool that would be another good way of uh, it's quite easy promoting to tell. best yeah. practice yeah okay yeah. then yeah. yeah right thanks for that on there on the famous dropping anchors that we uh, we all love and hate at the same time. Uh, the other issue that we come across as well is obviously on the through bolts. We sell quite a lot of through bolts mm. uh, and not many torque wrenches, unfortunately. We mention it, but mm. as I've mentioned before, you can't set a through bolt without a torque wrench. No, I mean, if you, as we said a bit earlier on about the types of anchors, most of the expansion anchors come under the torque controlled mm. anchor uh, part. So you've got the torque is, is critical because most of these products, once you've torqued them, will relax. Yeah. And the torque can relax up to 50%. So if you've already under torqued your anchor, say it should be 50 newton meters, yeah. and you've only reached 30, yeah. if it relaxes by 50%, that's down at 15. Yeah. Now, during the ETA, ETA process, this relaxation is accounted for to, to up to 50%. But if you're not torquing the anchor up correctly, you're not going to get the performance as per the data sheet, mm -hmm. as per for the design. But also, if you over torque the product, you can stress it. Um, and the way a, a, a through bolt works is that the clip locks into the concrete, and then the torque applied pulls the fixing through the cone through the clip to, uh, to achieve the load, maximum load mm -hmm. um, variable. If you don't use a torque wrench, you're never going to achieve the loads that, that are set yeah. there. And when we do our training, we often get people to, to install through bolts without a torque wrench just to gauge what people's perception of, of, of the actual talk is, yeah, yeah. And it can vary massively, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and it's quite an interesting Well, most thing to do. most people think to over-tighten it is better when... Yeah, 90% of them do over-tighten them, and if you yeah. do them, say, with a, an 8mm, and even sometimes a 10mm through bolt, if you took, you can talk it to a point where they'll shear, mm -hmm. so, you know, you can put that much stress through the, through the anchor, yeah. and most people, you're right, Steve, do over yeah, over talk them, yeah, yeah, because the, it's that clamping force that they're after yeah, achieving. Yeah. But again, yeah. you know, with that load relaxation, mm. 
you run the risk without a torque wrench of the clamping force not being sufficient enough to hold your fixture back, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, but it, but it, it's it's a and also from us as a manufacturer's point of view, if there's a failure on site mm. um, and you've not used a torque wrench, then you've not installed the fixing within the uh, manufacturer's guideline. So straight yeah. away, you've moved outside of BS 8539's criteria. Okay. Right. So a torque wrench is key, and I would uh, recommend every installer to own one. So I think what we've highlighted there with, with <coughs> two relatively simple anchors, drop-ins and uh, through bolts that everyone uses on a very popular yeah. daily basis yeah. that training is required mm. because there's there's two areas there that are that, that critically need need yeah, looking at. Yeah, it's education and knowledge as well yeah. because and there's no real excuse because if you look at the uh, the boxes for instance, most manufacturers with an ETA will actually put the torque setting on, on the, the box. box. Right, so, so it's there. So yeah. you, th you can't say I didn't know what it was or yeah. You know, it, 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 it's it's crucial. So your drill diameter, drill depth and torque is yeah. on the box, yeah? Yeah, depth, yeah. yeah Great. Yeah. So, again, yeah. recapping, we've looked at the selection process. Yeah. We've made sure it's reached the site. We've now trained the installers and supervisors on how to carry out the installation. Mm. What about this famous final one? I need a pull test doing, please, Pete, on site. Right. Okay, so this is a bit of a, 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 a can of worms, really. Yeah. Um, Site testing is covered quite extensively in BS 8539. Mm -hmm. And the main criteria is that the tester has to be competent. Now, the only real competency at the moment in the industry is through the CFA. Yeah. So you, you have to be you get a qualification as a CFA approved tester. And there's two levels. There's a proof tester and there's um, uh, an advanced. Now, if we break the three types of testing down, You've got ultimate load testing, you've got suitability testing, and you've got proof testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and each of these has got a valid point within the process of fixing selection. Uh, well, two have sorry. Um, ultimate load testing really is one that you try to avoid because you're testing the actual substrate. So this only really comes into play in looking at lightweight materials, problematic substrates like terracotta pots or um, block and beam systems where you don't really know. Yep. what the capacity of the concrete is or the, or the material the substrate is. So that's something really that is you do before you even look at what type of fixing you specify. After you're testing the capacity of the substrate you're working on. Yeah. And there's quite uh, some onerous uh, safety values have to be put into that because you're working from a failure down. Yeah. So we try to avoid um, ultimate load testing where it's not necessary. The problem we have as a manufacturer, and you probably find this yourself as, 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 a, as a technical distributor as well, is that a lot of people want the site test but don't know why they want it. So the first question we ask is why do you want the product tested and what do you want it tested to? Yeah. So the next test, which is I think is the most valid test, is suitability testing. Mm -hmm. Now the idea of suitability testing is you've pre-designed the anchor, you've said this anchor should achieve 10 kilonewtons in this concrete. So then what the client might want or the main contractor might want is proof that everything's as it should be. So what you do, you go out to site. If the safe working load is, say, 7 kilonewtons for argument's sake, you would test that fixing to up to three times that value for a resin and a mechanical anchor and up to five times for a, a nylon anchor. Yep. And <coughs> that just proves that that ankle, ankle, sorry, anchor mm -hmm. is suitable for that application in that substrate. For yeah. me, that's the most valid form of testing. Yeah. And that's the one there where the manufacturer get most called out to do, just to verify and, and, and just put the contractor's mind at ease that they've got the right system for that application. Yeah. Um, and it does test for things like voided blocks and hollow core pots and things like that. So it's, it's, it, it, I think that's probably the safest way of approaching testing on a site. But within BS8539, and particularly for companies who do uh, building um, insurance, they look at proof testing. Now, proof testing is probably the, uh, the, the greatest area of all, really, because a proof test is to test post-install fixings which are in service, and what we're testing at that point is the installer's work, mm -hmm. okay? So if you're looking at, say, resin fixings, and you're looking at, say, through bolts where you've got a protruding stud and you get a connector on, you can test the percentage of these products. It could be as little as five fixings. Yep. 
But most of um, your big insurance companies like an HBC will want either one in 25 or more commonly one in 40 victims tested. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> when we're doing this, as I say, we're testing the installer's work. Um, but the, the problem is that often a lot of these fixing systems, if they're flush fixed, say like a bolt head fixing or like a frame fixing, you can't test them. How do you attach to it? Yeah. So you get into a really diff difficult area there where people will actually do alongside testing, yeah. which really is, um, isn't valid because you can't test somebody's installation if you're not using the installed anchor that's being used. Yeah. So that's, that's quite problematic. But again, within the guidelines, there's quite strict regimes, and these are available off the website, TFA website. So it'll tell you how many fixes you should do, what load you should be going to, and, the, and what percentage of, yeah, of, that's of, of that's yeah. safety factor. So if you're doing uh, uh, one, in, one in 40 fixings, you're only allowed to go a maximum of one and a half times the applied load but that must not exceed the, the manufacturer's yeah. recommended load. Yeah. If you go to 1 in 25, which is more rigorous testing, you only need to do uh, 1.25 the load because you're doing mm -hmm. more tests. But it often it's becoming a bit of a box ticking exercise yeah, it is. or a commercial yeah. Yeah. Uh, requirement more than a, a, um, a safe installation issue. See, we as a supplier, we probably get asked for more proof testing than anything yeah. else. Well when we do as well. Ultimately, as you mentioned it, all we're doing is testing the install rather than the anchor. We already know the performance of the anchor. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 the there's a place for that because, as, we, as we've said, if you go back a, st a stage, mm. you know, 95, 97% of failures are due to poor installation. Yeah. So there's a real validity to doing proof testing, but then it's got to be a true proof test. Don't You shouldn't be going and testing fixings alongside because that's almost part of suitability. So I think our argument would be if you go on site and you train people with a toolbox talk mm -hmm. and you do the suitability testing to prove that the um the system's a correct system if it's installed within your manufacturer's guidelines it shouldn't need testing and it does state in the cfa that if you use an eta approved fixing and it's been installed to the manufacturer's guidelines there's not really a need to test if you invest all that money in yeah. proving an anchor is suitable for application, Why? you shouldn't have to retest. Correct. But um, you know we have to go with what the client wants and what the contractor wants sometimes. Yeah, it's usually the client that asks yeah. for yeah. Ask the client, ask the customer for that in the contract. I think all of us in the chain, including the uh, installer, have got the right to question why. Yeah. Why it's needed and is it is it a valid test? And there's certainly bits of information that we have to have before we turn up on site and. Yeah, yeah. The ma the main thing that you. For us as a manufacturer, when we go on, on, on to do a test, we first of all ask them how they've installed it. Mm -hmm. We ask to see the torque wrench. We we check what size drill they've used. They all, you know, have they set all the correct setting tools? And then we look at uh, the load requirement that the engineers put forward, check that against our recommended load. And as long as that doesn't exceed, yep. uh, we will test to three or five or whatever. Or Whatever's required, whatever's yeah. required. But you know, y you should really, before you do a test, ask the question: How have these been installed? Because if you start testing products that say haven't been torqued, you should say, "Well, hang on, before I test any of these, I'll come back next week. I need all these anchors torqued, yeah, because they're torque. We need them installed controlled. correctly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or if you look at the M and E systems and they haven't got any witness marks on, you know, these haven't been installed properly. What we don't want to test one that's going to fail because it's not been installed properly. If you can get the the contractor to install it correctly in the first place. So installation first, yep. then test. Okay, very valid point. Thank yeah, you for that. Yeah. So I think in a nutshell, uh, it's quite a lengthy document, BSA 539, but in a nutshell, we've covered the selection process mm -hmm. and what's required within that process, how to get that to site, so the supply. Yep. We've looked at the install, and the critical thing there is training, training, and a little bit more training. Yep. And then we've looked at the testing at the end of it. Yeah. And I think those four points, they tend to affect most M&E contractors, yeah. building services. Yeah. There's nothing else, I think, that BS8539 throws up that we need to be aware of? No, no, as I say, I think we have to look at the principle of it. You know, it's been designed to try and negate mm -hmm. any failures where there's risk to life and limb. Yeah. And also there's some quite high profile, currently, um, failures where there's massive 
commercial yeah, yeah, issues yeah, yeah. as well. Uh, absolutely, you know? yeah, and, absolutely. And a lot, uh, we're finding now more and more contractors are trying to implement uh, BS8539 to ensure they've got a fixings plan and they don't get uh, failures. Uh, yeah. Because <coughs> I think l luckily in this industry, most of the failures tend to be uh, a disaster from a commercial nature. Yeah. Or they've had a few very high profile recent yeah. uh, losses of life. Um, you know, which we're all trying to avoid that at the end yeah. of the day. But I think if a contractor um, complies with BS8539, yeah. there's far, far, far less chance of, of anything going wrong. Because you, you know, you've got a process from design all the way through to installation and with a bit of training and uh, uh, using the correct product. Yeah. And the biggest, uh, let's say, enemy we've got in this industry is I've always used that fixing, I've always done it that way. Correct. And we've got to try and educate people to get away from that mentality. So even if you're not compliant with BS8539 or you, d or you decide as a, as, a, as a contractor not to go down there, there's still bits within that um, that you can pick code up. of practice Absolutely, which yeah. you should Absolutely. apply yeah. just as a best practice yeah, scenario yeah. Yeah. For, for your company. Well, you mentioned it there for a contractor. That a, a, a good starting point is to have a fixings policy. Yeah. And that will be built around those four key elements. The selection process, how do we select it? The supply, how do we get it supplied? The install, what we're doing about training, and then finally, what's our testing program going to yeah, be? So yeah. if they cover those four areas, they're well on the way to having a compliant installation. Yeah, because that's what we're looking for, a compliant installation, because yeah. as I said before, if you've got the right fixing for the right application, it's yep. been installed correctly, y you're not going to get any failures. You're no, really not. exactly. It's a very exactly. simple product. They're very high performance. There's massive uh, elements of safety built into the design. Yep. You know, you're looking at one in four, um, safety factor so in theory if you've got four fixes in a plate one fix you just hold that plate up yeah the other three are there for the security no you're right you're uh, right insurance well. if you like thanks for that Pete. i appreciate that right. and i know you guys as a manufacturer you're quite passionate about raising the profile of fixings in in the industry as are we as are people like the cfa and it's our job our job as a supplier technical supplier the cfa's role your role is to raise the profile of anchors so they they're no longer considered at four o'clock in the afternoon for delivery next morning there's got to be a bit more thought process put to what fixings am i going to be using yeah th there's, there's two things really there's a din standard for metal structures and there's a din standard for concrete structures but to connect the two together yeah is often left to the contractor correct yeah or the distributor to advise or the or the manufacturer yeah so that, that you know that that's quite a strange scenario when you think that how critical know, that how is critical it is because yeah. that's, that's what holds everything together yeah and and i think you know and, and also when you go to do a a test they call you to test a ticker box after the um, job's finished. Well, what if it fails? Well, it's too late then, isn't you it? Know? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we would encourage yeah. people to look at BS8539 as a sort of benchmark of, of, of quality of installation. Yeah. And if you follow the rules and, and the processes and the due diligence in it, y you're not going to have any, any problems. No, we shouldn't see it as a hindrance. It's there no. to help. It's Definitely. there as a guideline. Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you again, Pete. Appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Cheers.